November 30th, 2022 will likely go down in history as either the beginning or the end of something. I remember talking to our engineering teacher and he was like, have you seen this? And I was like, have you seen this? Alexa Duda teaches computer science and technology at Tualatin High School. And what she was seeing was the public launch of ChatGPT. Our roles in the school are kind of like forward-thinking tech people because of what we teach with students. And we were showing it to students and, and trying to talk them through it as it was coming out. And ChatGPT wasn't the first AI chatbot to be made available to the public, but the two that came before it from the tech company Meta both flopped. They weren't good. ChatGPT, on the other hand, gained 30 million users in just a few months. If you typed a question, it would respond conversationally with an answer. Then it might offer more information on the topic. It could explain complicated ideas at a ninth grade or fifth grade level, wherever you were at. It could tell you about obscure historical events and then answer your follow-up questions. It was essentially a computer program that could teach you anything you wanted at your speed. It wasn't perfect yet, but it was pretty good and getting better all the time. The implications for educators were enormous. I just felt like it was my responsibility to help students learn how to navigate this as I'm learning how to navigate. It's like building the plane while it's flying. Oregon has, for the most part, helped educators pilot this particular plane. It was the first state to release guidelines for AI in K-12 schools in August 2023. Since then, 26 states and Puerto Rico have done the same. Some schools around the country, however, have tried to keep the plane from ever taking off. Now, the New York City Department of Education is cracking down on a particular tool. Students and teachers can no longer access an artificial intelligence chatbot that generates writing. It's called ChatGPT. From the Gert Boyle studio, I'm Jen Chavez, and this is The Evergreen, a podcast from OPB about the place you call home. Today on the show, how are students and teachers using AI in the classroom? Is it enhancing our ability to learn, destroying our ability to think, or just changing what learning looks like? OPB education reporter Natalie Pate and video producer Emily Hamilton recently spent some time looking into this. You can find their article and video at opb.org. The first thing to know about artificial intelligence is that this is not the first time teachers have had concerns about how a new technology will affect their students. Back in ancient Greece, Socrates worried that this hot new tool called writing would ruin people's memory. Why would anyone need to remember anything if it was all just written down somewhere? I hear frequently in that conversation the argument around a scientific calculator as yeah. as the example. Alina Dasha Pitala is currently a first-year student at Vanderbilt University. But when she talked with OPB over the summer, she had just graduated from the International School of Beaverton, where she'd been involved with the Oregon chapter of ENCODE, an organization dedicated to helping policymakers and the public navigate the future of AI, which you could argue is just a very sophisticated calculator. Like that was a new tool that came on and when it came into the scene, yeah. into the classroom, you had a lot of people who were like, oh, it's, it's thinking for the students. They're not gonna understand how the math works. The umbrella term for the concern here is cognitive offloading. Essentially, when a new technology does your thinking for you, and it's a real problem. The mental struggle of feeling frustrated and stuck, then figuring out a path forward, that's where your brain forms new connections, figures out new skills. It's important. But it didn't begin or end with calculators. When students first began to get internet access, everyone wondered how kids would learn research skills if they could just look stuff up online. 
And now the same concerns are surfacing again. I see a lot of this attitude of like, you know, this is something we will never be able to figure out or it's just, it's too quick, it's too much. But I think we are able to sort of work towards managing it and, you know, teaching students to evaluate, you know, the pros and cons of using it. Um, and I think just sort of moving away from that attitude of that it's developing too fast and we're helpless is kind of, you know, something that would help lead us in, in the right direction. The goal, Elena says, shouldn't be to keep kids from using AI, but to teach them the advantages and trade-offs. Even better, teach kids how to evaluate those trade-offs for themselves, for any new technology. The first step towards that goal, says Tualatin High School teacher Alexa Duda, is showing students how AI works. Because at the infancy, it felt like magic, right? It just like, what is happening here? How do you, how, how does it know this, right? And there's so many misconceptions about it, being able to like think on its own when really it just recognizes patterns and repeats them back. The technology behind most chatbots is called a large language model, or LLM. And the most basic explanation of how an LLM works is that it predicts the most likely next word in a sequence based on the patterns it has learned from vast amounts of text. Full disclosure, in the spirit of today's topic, we asked AI to help us write that last sentence. AI also helps Duda's younger students visualize exactly what that sentence really means. In her classes, students play a computer game in which you attempt to teach an AI to recognize fish. It has all these fish come across the screen, and you have to tell the chatbot, um, say if it's a fish or not. So it's pictures of fish and trash. And you train it over, you know, a set of 50, and then it tell it repeats back, like, I think this is a fish, or I think this is not a fish. And so it really helps kids understand, like, how it learns. Watching the model learn in real time demystifies it to some extent. It's like the old saying goes, Teach a computer to recognize fish, and it will sometimes get it wrong. Teach a kid to teach a computer to recognize fish, and they'll be skeptical for a lifetime. They'll understand where AI hallucinations come from. What do you mean by hallucinations? So an AI hallucination is where it says something with absolute certainty that is completely incorrect. Interesting. Yeah, so the, <laughs> okay. the training data that it has, it has picked a pattern out of it that's not accurate for our world. Okay. And so that's another thing that we have to help kids understand, like when is the AI hallucinating versus when it's um, giving you factual information. And then it also it allows like us to have conversations about like who's feeding that data into the large language model um, and where are they getting that information and what's included and what's not included. Are things being excluded on purpose um, or is it a bias that humans don't realize they have? Um, so it, it leads to those conversations as well. But for all of AI's blind spots and factual errors, there are some ways that it excels. A good chatbot can give feedback as quickly as a student can ask for it and give kids more personalized attention than any classroom teacher ever could. It's also very good at staying detached and neutral. We did this project, the AI education project, and we tried to talk to different students and get their perspectives on different AI tools and why they might gravitate towards using AI in their schoolwork in the first place. And a lot of them um, responded with sort of this idea that AI doesn't judge them. They have this feeling that, um, you know, for their assignments, when they have maybe questions that seem a little bit maybe dumb or seem a little bit simple or questions that they might feel embarrassed to ask in front of the whole class or even embarrassed to ask their teachers, they feel like AI can give them that answer and help them work through problems and give them more attention that maybe their teachers or fellow classmates may not be able to give them. There are also enormous benefits for students with disabilities. Tiger Tualatin Library Media Specialist Casey Fernandez told a story about a special education teacher, Bruce Alter, who used AI tools to help students in wheelchairs who cannot speak complete assignments in ways they never had before. And they have a guide that shows how you can um, adjust the text with the student's 
input to make sure that it's actually saying what the student is intending. And um, it is a fascinating process to watch and it just, it gives me hope about some of the good things that it can be used for. So to recap, generative AI tools are the latest in a long line of innovations that have changed how students learn and how teachers teach. They sometimes get basic facts wrong, but their feedback is faster and more personalized than human teachers, and they can be a game changer for students with disabilities. Sounds like a pretty positive development, right? Maybe. After the break, we'll get into some downsides and even the dark sides of AI. That's coming up. Thanks for listening to The Evergreen, our podcast from OPB about the place you call home. If you like what you hear, subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app, and we'll teach you something new about what's going on in the Pacific Northwest every Monday morning. You can also follow OPB on Instagram, at OPB Photo, or follow me directly at Jen Chavez OPB. That's Jen with two N's, and I'll keep you posted on everything Team Evergreen is up to. And remember, this episode about how AI is reshaping the landscape of K-12 education and all the great reporting and storytelling you hear on this show is made possible by the support of many thousands of OPB members. On October 1st, that cut to our federal funding you probably heard about officially kicked in. And from now on, public media organizations like OPB are community supported more than ever. Join in and support our journalism by becoming an OPB sustaining member today at opb.org slash pod. And now, back to the show. A long, long time ago, back in 2022 and 2023 when AI was new, most of the concerns about AI in the classroom focused on students using it to do less work. Especially in school with what we were sort of learning and hearing about AI, it was mostly like, don't use AI to cheat. One of the first policies that Tiger Tualatin put into place was a red-yellow-green coding system that allowed teachers to easily communicate their expectations around the use of AI on assignments. So um, if it's green, they can use AI without citation. Yellow, they can use AI, but they must cite it. And red is for that specific task or skill measurement, there is no AI allowed. Recent high school student Alina Pitala says that recently kids have started policing themselves on AI for reasons that have nothing to do with academics. During finals her senior year, she was studying with friends, maybe five minutes before a test, and they wanted to look something up quickly. And you know, sometimes when you search things up on Google with like a science heavy topic, you just get all these long research papers and articles that you don't really have time to read when you have five minutes before an exam. And so I and another friend had suggested, you know, like, why don't we just ask ChatGPT? And then there was another, you know, person that was present that was like, you know, I would reconsider that because do you know how much energy is actually being used when you just utilize ChatGPT or a form of generative AI, um, just kind of like your new search engine, like your new Google. One researcher calculated that every AI query uses roughly the same energy as leaving a light bulb on for 20 minutes. That's about 10 times as much energy as an old-fashioned Google search. And with billions of queries a day, it adds up. We never really learned about, you know, how AI is harming the planet and how much water is actually used to, you know, power the, these different like data centers. And just, you know, when you use ChatGPT or whatever, you know, how, how much energy is being used. The environmental repercussions are one thing. The emotional repercussions are something else. Because while we've mostly been discussing the chatbot versions of AI, there are also image and video tools that can be prompted to generate realistic photos or footage of almost anything. Students are being bullied and sexually harassed with deep faked nudes of their classmates or themselves. One survey found that 40 to 50 percent of students were aware of deep fakes circulating in schools. 
Tiger Tualatin's Casey Fernandez told OPB that the district's response to this has been development of a responsible use of technology policy that covers not just academic integrity, but also explicitly bans any form of digital mimicry of other students. And so just to make sure I'm understanding correctly, the academic integrity is more so like plagiarism, use of someone else's thoughts, Mm -hmm. whereas mimicry is using someone's image or likeness without their consent or permission. Exactly, yes. And it doesn't matter what context it's used for, even if it's a a silly or fun thing, or if it's something that's more harmful, that is something that we completely discourage. So AI tools can be used to accelerate learning or harass other students. They provide access and academic resources for students with disabilities, but also consume massive amounts of energy. Like any new technology with the power to change how we interact with the digital world, it's neither entirely good nor entirely bad. It's just new and pretty much unstoppable. At a recent conference, Alexa Duda realized that kids who didn't learn how to use AI were going to be left behind. I heard a speaker there talk about how it's a major equity issue, that it's here, people are using it, it's going to be used in the workplace now and in the future, and that if we're not preparing students for it, that we're setting them behind, and that there are some kids that are going to have access no matter what, and other kids who won't, and that schools have to make up that gap for them. And after leaving that conference, I just felt like this needs to be happening now, yesterday, in my classroom. Maybe it's helpful here to list the things that this new technology hasn't changed. Kids still want to engage with and be prepared for the real world. A teacher's job is bringing it to them at a pace and speed and in ways that they can handle and learn from. Maybe November 30th, 2022 wasn't the beginning or the end of anything. Maybe it was simply a historically teachable moment. I already teach technology, which is always evolving. And the technology I teach today is not the technology they're going to need in the workforce in five years, 10 years, 20 years. We can't predict what those things are going to be, but I can carry them along with me as the new technology emerges. So then they know how to do that on their own. And then when they are adults off in the world, they can keep up with those things and still be prepared for their 21st century job that we can't imagine. And I just thought this is the moment to do it, right? This is the time I need to educate myself and then I need to help them learn how it works, when we should use it, the ethics and concerns with it. So we are using it responsibly in our world. You can read Natalie Pate's article and watch OPB's AI and Education Explainer video produced by Emily Hamilton at opb.org. Thank you for listening to The Evergreen, a podcast from OPB. Peter Frick Wright produced this episode, and our technical director is Stephen Cray. Nalene Silva engineered the episode. The OPB podcast team also includes Mia Estrada, Julie Sabatier, and Sage Van Wing. Natalie Pate and Emily Hamilton did the interviews you heard. Music in this episode comes from Audio Network. And if you have a question for us, don't forget you can just reach out. Send us an email at theevergreen at opb.org. I'm Jen Chavez. Catch you later. <laughs>